Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Boris Jeremich. Uh, today we continue with our online lecture series. Today we're going to look, uh, we're going to talk about uh, energy dissipation, uh, modeling and calculation theory behind it for solids. Uh, we're joined by Mr. Heshan Wang, who's going to present soon Hi. about some of his specialties and some of his work. And today's presentation is by Dr. Han Yang, who will who spend a lot of time uh, working on this and who actually did some really great work. So Han, please take it away and uh, share your screen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Boris. So let me just share my screen. And... Great. It's easy. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes. okay, great. Uh, yeah, so as Professor Boris mentioned, today we're going to uh, continue our lecture on energy dissipation. So this is the uh, outline of the uh, entire energy dissipation uh, uh, online course series. So today we're going to talk about the uh, seismic energy input and the energy balance in a so uh, soil structure interaction system. And specifically we'll uh, talk about the modeling and calculation of plastic energy dissipation uh, in solids. So first we start with the uh, seismic energy uh, input into the system. So uh, when we think about a, uh, a seismic wave, this is the picture we already have in our mind. Uh, like this picture I'm showing right there, you have a, a rupture, earthquake rupture at one point, and then uh, a significant amount of energy is released. And then the uh, energy will propagate together with the seismic wave. And then um, what we really care about is the amount of energy that arrives at a local site and then this amount of energy will uh, transform and dissipate it and then cause your structure to shake and also damage. So this concept is really named as the uh, energy flux of seismic, uh, of seismic waves. So according to Professor Aki and Richards in 2002 in their books, um, the rate of uh, sorry, the flux rate of energy transmission in a plane wave is defined as the amount of energy transmitted per unit time across per unit area, normal to the direction of the propagation. Um, this is the uh, equation you can use to calculate this energy. Now here are some important assumptions that goes together with this equation. So first of all, it assumes that the uh, per, uh, the media is homogeneous and isotropic uh, elastic. And second one, uh, we assume that the wave is only uh, only for plane wave or slightly curved waves. And also the third one, the seismic energy propagation is confined in a ray tube with a clear definition of uh, propagation direction. Now, as you can see, those three assumptions are pretty strict. So that leads uh, to a, some difficulties in apl applying this equation to actual uh, prop uh, practical soil structural interaction problems. So basically we need uh, to develop our own uh, method to calculate the amount of energy that comes inside our uh, system. And that is very tightly related to the method we're using to apply uh, seismic motion to our system. So seismic motion is a, a applied to a finite element model of local soil structure interaction system using the domain reduction method uh, developed by Bellick uh, and his colleagues in 2003. Uh, in previous lectures, uh, you have seen Professor Boris talk about uh, the DRM method in detail. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, but this is the method we're going to use and uh, uh, the uh, approach we're going to use to calculate the amount of energy input into the system is very related to that. So the seismic uh, motion uh, in DRM is transformed into DRM forces and applied to the nodes within the DRM layer. So imagine you have a uh, soil structure interaction model like that. You have a structure on top, soil beneath, and then you have the DRM layers. So the DRM forces are applied on the nodes uh, in those layers. So then the, seismic, the, the system energy is defined as basically the force multiplied with the incremental displacement, which is uh, implied in this equation right there. So the total energy in a soil structure interaction system uh, from the beginning uh, which is time equal to zero to time t can be calculated using this equation right here. Uh, you see that there's summation in the integral that represents uh, multiple loadings because we already have uh, a multiple number of uh, DRM nodes. 
So, so essentially, so, essentially, essentially, you're yes. essentially taking all those nodes and calculating energy propagation through that surface uh, by essentially multi integrating over time, however long it takes, minutes or half a minute, all the forces yes. and uh, and the velocities of those nodes. Yes, exactly. And and but the, the the important thing is that that's the energy that goes in and comes out of the system. So. So it's the energy that goes through the system and then part of that energy is going to be dissipated. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. So uh, and next we move on to the overall energy balance in a dynamic inelastic system. So we start from the equation of motion in its uh, global incremental form. So this is the equation right there. On the, on the left-hand side, you have the uh, acceleration proportional term, you have the velocity proportional term, and then the displacement proportional term. Then on the right-hand side, you have the uh, forcing terms. So from there, we simply multiply both sides of the equation with the uh, velocity vector, and then uh, do a little bit mathematical um, rearrangement. We arrive at the uh, energy balance equation in its global rate form. So this is the equation right here. So now from this equation, we can identify each energy terms. So the first term right there is clearly the, kinet uh, the kinetic energy term right there. And then the second term is related to the viscous damping. So this is the energy dissipation due to viscous damping in the system. And then the third term is actually the most interesting part. We call it the third term in, in, in total as the material work, but it actually can be separated into these three terms. The first one is energy dissipation due to material damage or plasticity. Uh, so we simply call it as plastic dissipation. The second term is the plastic free energy. So remember, uh, we talk uh, a lot about the origin and the, the physical nature of plastic free energy in our previous lecture. The third term is the strain energy that we are all familiar with. So these are the five energy terms that we can calculate in our system. So next, we move on to the thermomechanical framework. So this framework is used to calculate uh, the amount of plastic dissipation and plastic free energy and strain energy that is uh, transformed from the material work. So we start from the first law of thermodynamics. Again, it's in the local incremental form. Uh, this equation was given by Professor Collins and Hosby in 1997. So on the left hand side, this is the material work is simply the stress multiplied with the incremental strain tensor. So that's the material work. And it can be separated into the free energy and the plastic dissipation. So here are some pretty important assumptions. So the assumption number one is that the process is isothermal. So uh, first of all, this is an uh, approximation widely adopted by the studies uh, in this field. So the purpose is to uh, eliminate the temperature influence in an explicit form. So temperature effect is usually not considered explicitly in classic structural and geotechnical me mechanics. So in order uh, to use our theory to calculate uh, energy dissipation for material models that, that is usually used in our field, we need to make it compatible. So that's why we have this uh, assumption. Um, note that we do have more complex theories and constituted models uh, developed by other researchers. So if you're interested, you can go ahead and uh, read those papers. So according to the second law of thermodynamics, uh, the plastic dissipation should always be non-negative. Uh, this is very important and needs to be demonstrated after plastic dissipation function is developed. Uh, later, when I move on to uh, specific material models, I will demonstrate how this should be done. Okay, so next we move on to uh, assumption number two, which is the decoupled material assumption. So we assume that the strain tensor can be additively decomposed into a elastic and a plastic component. So this assumption is usually taken as default in a small strain elastoplastic theory. So it's also very common and uh, widely, uh, widely accepted. So uh, together with the assumption, we can also decompose the uh, free energy or the Helmholtz free energy. So in the uh, additive forms. So uh, we assume that the free energy can be decomposed into 
an elastic term and a plastic term. So the elastic term is called elastic free energy or the strain energy, which is a more familiar name to us. And then we have the plastic free energy. Now, this is actually the, where the name plastic free energy comes from. This is the plastic part of the free energy. So the elastic free energy or strain energy, uh, we are very, very familiar with it and we know how to calculate that directly. So the incremental uh, elastic free energy equals to the uh, stress tensor multiplied with the incremental elastic strain tensor. On the other hand, the plastic free energy is a little bit more complicated uh, to calculate. So uh, in our previous lecture, we have established that the change of plastic free energy is caused by the evolution of uh, material microstructure. So therefore, uh, plastic free energy is related to the hardening mechanisms used in plasticity model and should be the function of the material internal variables. So uh, under that thought, we further decompose the plastic free energy into different terms that are, uh, that each term is associated with the hardening mechanism it is used in the material model. So for example, if your material model has a isotropic hardening mechanism, we assume the plastic free energy has contribution from both terms and they can be simply added together. And each of those terms are associated with the material internal variable that is that controls the hardening mechanism itself. For example, in the isotropic hardening term, we see it's a function of the internal variable K, which represents the size of the yield surface. Similarly, in the kinematic hardening term, it is a function of the backstress, which controls the kinematic hardening mechanism. So the exact expression of the plastic free energy depends uh, on the form of the hardening rules, which is why um, later, we will move on to specific material models, and then we will see that for specific model, it can change its form. So, uh, as pointed out by Professor Dafalius in 2002, the thermodynamic conjugates to each of the internal variables uh, exist, and uh, each part of the plastic free energy can be assumed to be only a function of these conjugates. So, so here uh, we have the expressions for the isotropic and the kinematic components of the plastic free energy. As you can see, uh, they are expressed in terms of these uh, thermodynamic conjugates. So this thermodynamic conjugates uh, can also be related back to the corresponding internal variables by the following expressions. So if we take this e expression back to the equation, we can finally have the plastic free energy that is expressed in terms of the internal variables themselves. So this is the um, expression we're gonna use in our calculations. Uh, as you can see, it is only a function of the, uh, of the material internal variables and uh, the constants you defined when you define the material. Oh, uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure, yes. Yeah, yeah so, so, so how, how about for if I have a model uh, which is a perfect plasticity? So there's no, say, there's no kinematic and no, no isotropic. I yes. think it, it also has a plastic free energy, right? Uh, that is I a good question. Is, and yeah. the answer is no, because- No, no plastic yeah, free energy. Because, because if you think about it, the underlying assumption for a perfectly plastic is that you are actually assuming that the material does not evolve at all. So there is mm -hmm. no evolution of internal variables. And mm -hmm. if you remember uh, the physical nature of plastic free energy is that it is related to the evolution of the microstructure of the system. So if you assume there's no evolution, then there's no evolution of plastic yeah. free energy. Yeah, yeah, good point. But actually, oh, okay. so, so, so for perfectly plastic, the plastic free energy does not exist, but the actual plastic work is actually equal to dissipation. For kinematic, you have to take this into the account, but it's gonna show that it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't get you there. And then for kinematic, it, kinematic is the only proper one that's actually gonna give you some proper dissipation. Yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yes, okay. So uh, next, we move on to uh, two specific material models that's uh, commonly used uh, for solids. So first, we have the pressure-independent solid material models. So uh, pressure-independent material models are usually used to model metals and alloys because according to experiments, uh, those materials, uh, the mechanical behaviors of those materials doesn't really change much uh, when you change the hydrostatic pressure applied on those materials. 
Yes. Can I say so, so actually, it's also used for uh, fully saturated uh, total stress analysis of clays, because if you have a fully saturated right. material with very low permeability, any additional confinement goes to fluid phase, and the shear the shear behavior essentially is picked up by the solid phase. And so the same material is only used to actually use for total stress analysis of clays. Right. Yes. Yes, that's right. Oh, yes. So, uh, uh, yes. So the model, the theory we're using here is the associated foam means as plasticity. And this is the expression for the yield function. Um, it's a pre pretty standard yield function for uh, foam means as plasticity. As you can, it's a function of the uh, the rhetoric part of the stress tensor and also the uh, internal variables. And here is the uh, hardening rule we're using together with this model. This is the armstrong frederick uh, nonlinear kinematic hardening rule. So as you can see, uh, it's a kinematic hardening rule. So it defines the evolution of the back stress. Uh, one thing to notice is that uh, the incremental back stress is also a function of back stress itself. That means early when we calculate this material, we need to some, we need to have some sort of iteration going on. So, but anyway, that's not important. Uh, this is the hardening rule we're gonna use. So if we put this hardening rule inside the expression we derived earlier, we can actually calculate the uh, plastic free energy due to the kinematic hardening. So here we are assuming that uh, we don't have iso isotropic hardening. So the only contribution to plastic free energy comes from the uh, kinematic hardening. So the actual plastic dissipation can be calculated by subtracting the plastic free energy from the plastic work. So this term is a plastic work, which is the stress tensor multiplied with the plastic strain tensor, then minus the uh, plastic free energy term. And this is the final expression we arrive at for the plastic dissipation for this uh, specific material model. And uh, if you remember earlier, uh, I mentioned that we need to demonstrate that the second law of thermodynamics is always maintained. So here uh, we have that uh, using this expression, we can derive that this expression mathematically is always non-negative. So that means the second law of therm thermodynamics is maintained and it is a very important part of our system. So next, yep. So next, we move on to the uh, pressure-dependent solid material. Uh, this type of uh, material models are usually used to model uh, like soil, rock, concrete, bones, uh, powders, and other pressure-sensitive materials. So the theory here we're using is the uh, so-called non-associated joker prager plasticity. Uh, this is the yield function. You can see the, uh, the, the main difference between this one and the previous one is that we have the uh, pressure, uh, the pressure term uh, in the yield function. And uh, the, here is the so-called non-associated plastic flow. Uh, the reason why I'm presenting this one right here is because it's going to be used in our expression later for the plastic free energy and plastic energy dissipation uh, terms. So uh, here we have a few material model constants that controls the volumetric part of the plastic flow. Uh, we note that the uh, plastic flow becomes purely deviatoric when the constant, this uh, C parameter equals to zero. So this is that expression right there. Can, can, I, can yes. I add one thing? So, so the yield function, so you see there are two, two locations where you see P, the, the mean stress, the one that's defined below. So the second location should go there with, when there's a square root of two over three. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that, that one, that's the one that controls, that, that, that's the one that gives you cone. But that cone actually goes through nonlinear kinematic hardening of Armstrong Frederick type, but it's the rotational hardening. It rotates like this. And that's because this first term under the first Sij minus P times alpha Ij, those two P times alpha Ij. So alpha Ij is the, num the amount of shift directorically. As you get close to the stress origin, shift goes to zero because P is zero. As you get far away, you start to rot. You start to rotate your your uh, your um, the cone. So just to note, and th this is all in lecture notes, but please go ahead. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, with those expressions, we can go ahead and uh, oh, uh, b but before we go to the uh, energy term, so here we. Kinematic hardening. Uh, we are still using the same uh, hardening mechanism, but the expression is a little bit different because here uh, we assume the back stress is only associated with the deviatoric part of the plastic uh, the plastic flow tensor. So this is the expression right there. So here uh, we need to consider 
uh, the actual contribution uh, to the plastic free energy from the volumetric part and the divertory part of the plastic strain. So according to multiple studies uh, by uh, researchers uh, in, as early as 1967 and as recent as 2000, um, the plastic strain due to isotropic compression uh, leads to the change of fabric in granular materials. So that means the volumetric part of the plastic strain should be related to plastic free energy because that's the physical nature of it. So then we have the plastic free energy um, that due to the kinematic hardening, <coughs> excuse me, uh, comes down to this expression. So compared to the previous expression, we have this additional term right there that comes from the volumetric part of the plastic uh, flow tensor. So with that expression of, of the plastic free energy, we can use the same strategy to calculate the plastic dissipation. So we use the plastic work minus the plastic uh, free energy. And this is the expression we arrived at the end. As you can see, it's right there. And again, we need to demonstrate that the second law of thermodynamics is maintained, which means that this uh, plastic dissipation function is always non-negative, as you can see the derivation is right there. So uh, this is a brief uh, derivation for uh, more details. I can refer to our lecture notes and our papers. Uh, here are uh, the list of references I used in this presentation. So if you're interested, let's go ahead and uh, check them out. Uh, so that would be uh, the presentation for this part uh, here. Are are my collaborators and the founding sources. And again, for more information, please go to the uh, Real Easy website for more information. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So great. So we'll, we'll stop here. We'll continue with energy dissipation for structural members, beams, and so on. And then we'll continue. Next lecture will be uh, energy dissipation for, from viscosity and from, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, other algorithmic numerical density. So thank you all. I'll stop recording right now.